So what can you do with an idea as powerful as revolution? Well, I guess you can take the first letter, the R, and make it lowercase and put it in brackets. A bit safer for the corporate sponsors now. Revolution used to mean a complete overthrow of the ruling system. But now it's a TED Talk theme. It's just another word that products, companies, and individuals use, and they actually promote the current status quo. They don't try to overthrow it. A nerdy touchscreen watch is a revolution. A toaster, which tries to burn a smiley face into your bread, is breakfast revolution. <laughs> What was once the strongest of political ideals is now a buzzword used by tech bros to describe their newest mobile app. But radical change was something young people across the world have fought for for generations. And while the student revolutionaries of 1968 and the post-war era might not have achieved an entire new system, they did manage to achieve some very important evolutions. Workers' rights and fair wages, universal education and health care, a fair tax system which used to enable economies to grow while decreasing inequality. But our generation has found that these past evolutions are being undermined. Solidarity and society are being replaced with self-help and cynicism. You see, we didn't grow up under Mama Revolution. Our mother's name was Tina. There is no alternative. You know, we're criticized for being politically inactive. I believe that's because we've grown up in, under an ideology which has told us that things are how they are and there's no other way. Ask for fair wages for a day's work and you're called an entitled millennial. Oppose education fee rises and you're called a senseless idealist. Demand your rights to health coverage or social security from your boss and they'll show you the door. Institutions, companies, organizations all across the world are exploiting young people and ignoring the established norms. And sometimes it seems we can do nothing about it. Now, growing up, I always dreamed of a career at the United Nations, an organization dedicated to promoting equality between and within states. I studied international relations and seemed to be on the right path, but as I finished my studies, I began to notice something very strange. My friends were working, but they weren't really working. They'd found jobs which weren't really jobs. They were unpaid internships, something none of us want, but a broken employment market has somehow convinced us we need. Across Europe every year, there are five million interns, three million of whom are unpaid. Just to put that into perspective, that's like the entire workforce of Norway working for free, an entire EU nation of unpaid, unshowered interns. And it's not just in the international field that this disease has taken hold. In the arts, media, film, law, business, PR, across the board, We're told it's all about valuable experience, these two words. Traditionally, employee and employer discuss and come to a middle ground on what the value of labor is worth. But value ex valuable experience has undermined this. Employers have taken advantage of widespread youth unemployment to commodify the very opportunity to work. And they've done this by convincing us that working for them is a privilege, a prestige, an opportunity of value. But this isn't necessarily true. Recent studies have consistently shown that this experience of working for nothing does not actually increase your job prospects. A US study found that people with paid internship experience managed to double their chances of getting a job offer, while those who did unpaid work had virtually the same chance as those who didn't do an internship at all. So don't let them convince you that you're worth nothing. Don't devalue yourself. But actually, it's not just about you. The fact is, when you do an unpaid internship, you do real work. Ask anyone who's done one, and they'll tell you it's not just photocopying and coffee runs. You're doing work which, if they hadn't tricked someone into doing for free, would need to be done by a real employee. So when you take an unpaid internship, you're increasing downward pressure on wages. You're increasing job cuts and layoffs. You're increasing precarity of employment. And if employers really believe their claim that their valuable experience will help you get a job, then they have to also accept that they are contributing to inequality by offering unequal opportunities. People from wealthy backgrounds can take up these positions, while those who can't afford to work for free never get their first step on a rigged employment ladder. Now, obviously, inequality is one of the key issues our generation is facing, 
The United Nations even dedicated an entire sustainable development goal to the topic. So when I found out the United Nations itself employs thousands of unpaid interns a year, I couldn't really believe it. What about the UN Declaration on Human Rights? Everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration for work and equal pay for equal work. What about the UN Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which says young people should not be socially or economically exploited? If the UN, the standard bearer on human rights, isn't implementing its own principles, then how can they expect anyone else to listen to them? The hypocrisy was just so clear, but it seemed to be mostly ignored, because internships have fallen through the cracks in our moral codes and legal systems. If you speak out, you risk losing your reference letter, something you spent months working for free to earn. This system is putting us in a position which makes us unpolitical, which makes us unable to assert our own rights. And if you don't speak out and you take the job, you end up perpetuating a discriminatory system which might not actually affect you, but definitely affects others. So after graduating, my partner Natalie and I found ourselves faced with this very dilemma, and so we came up with a plan. We decided to apply for internships across Europe in the hope of getting one and making a film to discuss the issues that, that the policy creates. Then one morning, an email popped into my inbox. It was the Holy Grail, the career launcher, an internship at the UN in Geneva. I remember calling up my grandma and telling her, hey, um, I've got a job at the UN. And she says, oh, wow, that's great. What are they paying you? <laughs> and so I tried to explain. I said, it's an, it's an unpaid internship. Pardon? <laughs> it's, it's like a job. You do real work, except uh, they don't pay you. Well, tell them to bugger off then. <laughs> you know, maybe I should have listened to her advice, because Geneva is one of the most expensive cities in the world. It, the, the minimum wage which you need to cover your basic costs is over 2,000 euros a month, so it's completely off limits for the average person. If you're from a developing country or a low family income, you can forget about it. Now, I'm from New Zealand, and while it is true that we all live in hobbit holes under the hills, we're, we're not actually a developing country. The UN stats show that 59% of interns are from developed states, while only 5% are from least developed countries. So, as a white, middle-class boy from the West, I'm certainly not representative of those most excluded by this policy. I felt that if I took this opportunity without trying to do anything to change it, then I would be just as hypocritical as the system itself. And so, me and Natalie came up with a little plan. I would take the internship and live in a tent while she documented the experience and coordinated all the events. And she really deserves equal credit on this, or responsibility, depending on how you look at it. The tent seemed to be the perfect solution. It gave us a way to live in Geneva for free, it provided a perfect backdrop for our documentary and unpaid act, and it was symbolic of the way that the current policy leaves interns with literally no support. So we found a little spot to camp on the edge of Lake Geneva, right next to the UN's members-only beach club. And there I was the next morning, walking through the gates and into the marble palace of the United Nations, in an unironed suit and hair that smelled like lake water. But everyone there was perfectly friendly, and most of them agreed that something needed to change. But the UN is facing increasing pressure to cut costs. It's being corporatized, with CEOs moving into leadership positions, often using the UN to promote the interests and practices of the private sector. Ironically, the companies that they're coming from actively erode the UN's mission by aggressively avoiding the taxes which are needed to provide the UN budget. And the system of internships seems to push these budgetary problems right down the food chain to the interns at the bottom. So we decided it would be good to get things moving a bit. We leaked the fact that a UN intern was sleeping in a tent to a few Geneva newspapers expecting to provoke a small local discussion. The next morning, I walked into my office and the phone on my desk was ringing. The story had exploded. BBC, New York Times, Al Jazeera, they were all finally talking about unpaid internships. The press even managed to track down my mum in New Zealand. <laughs> I had to ring her up and say, Mum, please don't talk to New York Times, it's embarrassing. The for-profit press works on a largely sensationalist model. It's hard to get them to talk about an idea or issue unless you can provide a clear image. And the image they latched onto was about the unfortunate kid living in a tent because they wanted a shocking story, not a political act. But the story did open up the topic for worldwide debate 
and suddenly employers were forced to explain or defend their policies. After the coverage, it was a little bit awkward at work, so we made the decision to end the project, to resign, but to use the resignation to make a statement. And so, on International Youth Day, August 15th, we held a makeshift press conference denouncing the unpaid policy and calling for change in front of the UN and the world's media. And uh, here's the UN's famous response to this act. We, we have six interns at the UN Information Service, and I think they're a happy bunch. If you disagree, please say something. See? They're giggling. Um, they're having a great time. <laughs> After this slightly bizarre response, the UN's Geneva spokesperson then claimed that there's a General Assembly resolution which prohibits the payment of interns. But after getting his own interns to search through the archives for two days, he came out on Twitter and admitted that they couldn't find it because it didn't exist. If the UN really wants to pay its interns, they can propose this in a wider budget to member states, but they are yet to do so. Instead, they recently raised the wages of their highest paid staff by 10%. If they had the political will, paying all the, of their interns a stipend would cost less than 0.5% of the UN's budget, which is nothing considering interns now make up almost 10% of their staff. Now, I've heard some people say, oh, we, we shouldn't really pay interns because then we won't be able to have as many interns. Now, I've never really understood this argument. It sounds like a 19th century plantation owner who says we shouldn't pay the slaves because then we sh won't be able to have as many slaves. Now, Unpaid internships are not slavery, but any system which relies on exploitation to, con to continue is a broken system. The real problem here is that unpaid internships have replaced entry-level jobs. In 1996, the UN employed fewer than 200 interns, but instead they had entry-level positions available. And now they have thousands of unpaid interns every year and have virtually no entry-level positions. And it's not just limited to the UN, in the 80s, 3% of US students did an internship, and now that figure is 75%. This is all part of a wider shift in the labor market, which has forced real wages for workers and young people down, while increasing profits and wages for those at the top. The neoliberal crowd like to call this labor market flexibility. But let's be clear, what these employers are doing is shifting their budget problems onto us. We're already the most indebted generation in history. A debt which binds us to certain career paths, a debt which discourages us from speaking out. Unpaid internships are part of this wider system. A system which, since the day we were born, has been increasing inequality. A system which enables huge corporations to avoid paying billions of dollars in tax while ordinary people suffer the consequences. A system which turns these tax dodgers like Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs into revolutionary heroes. A system which claims there isn't enough money to fund education, there isn't enough money to fund public health care, there isn't enough money to pay young people for the work that they do. A system which claims there is no alternative. But young people all over the world need to reject Mother Tina's lie. Insights such as the Panama Papers show that the money is there for quality public services for all. The money is there to pay young people a living wage. According to estimates by Tax Justice Network and Jeffrey Sachs, the over $30 trillion hidden in offshore tax havens could end world poverty eight times over. There's nothing revolutionary or progressive about a system which continues to allow this to happen. And clearly, there are alternatives. So to all you people out there who have employed unpaid interns who are feeling a bit uncomfortable, don't worry. There's something you can do. It's not radical or revolutionary. In fact, it's very simple. Recognize our value and live up to your own values. Pay your interns a fair wage. Human Rights Watch. You're an equal opportunities employer. Live up to your values. Pay your interns. Amnesty International. You want to end inequality? Live up to your values. Pay your interns. The United Nations. If you really want to empower youth, start by proving to us that you can stand by your values. Pay your interns. How can we have any faith in these institutions if our first experience is one of hypocrisy and exploitation? Why should we participate in a labor market which tries to convince us that we're worth absolutely nothing? And how can we find solutions to the problems that we've been left with when you keep telling us that we have to accept things the way they are? We want to believe. We want to politically engage. 
But first, we need these systemic factors which breed apathy and exclusion to change. This screwed up, unequal, and exploitative practice, which has somehow been normalized, needs to come to an end. We will not be the intern generation any longer. Thank you. <laughs>